Today I'm going to talk a little bit about my research in quantum chemistry aimed at designing the next generation of light-driven devices. So I'll briefly motivate this area by asking the question, why do we want to use light to drive devices? The dimensions of single molecules are often on the order of tens of nanometers or smaller. And the electronic degrees of freedom actually respond on the order of femtoseconds. And that makes it very difficult to access the unique quantum mechanical properties that these systems exhibit. However, there have been two important technological advances that have actually led the way towards developing new devices. The first of these is the development of light sources that allow us to interact with molecules on the relevant time and length scales. And the second is um, the development of synthesis methods that give us a high degree of control in developing new materials. And both of these technological advances have led the way toward what I would call the age of molecular metamaterials. And these allow us to create materials with properties and structures that aren't found in nature. So some of the interesting things that we can do are design new materials with specific optical properties and access the quantum mechanical effects to apply them to very interesting applications such as quantum computing, solar energy conversion, and molecular circuits. So how can we use light in devices? The entry point is getting light into the device, and this is usually referred to as light harvesting. So in molecular systems, we usually see discrete quantized energy levels. And here I've shown the ground and the first excited electronic state separated by a certain energy range. An incoming photon has the probability of being absorbed by kicking an electron up from the ground to excited state. This, allow, this forms the creation of what's known as an electron hole pair, or exciton. And once the system's on this excited state, it now propagates on a completely different potential energy surface, giving rise to many unique quantum mechanical properties. One of the most interesting characteristics of these systems are the way that energy is transferred directly after photo excitation. And this is what I'll call excitation energy transfer. Usually we can describe this process in terms of a set of discrete electronic states, which are spatially and energetically described by this system. By allowing the electronic wave function to propagate in these systems, you can see that it becomes delocalized not only spatially, but energetically. And I'll describe how we can actually use this characteristic in, in a device capacity. So this is still a relatively new area of research. And as in many cases, we look toward natural systems to provide insight into the development of synthetic devices. One of the most promising naturally occurring systems are photosynthetic light harvesting complexes. And these systems are ubiquitous in nature and have evolved to allow biological systems to trap incoming photons from the sun and convert this energy into useful energy for the system with an extremely high efficiency. So it might seem like the path forward could involve actually using these types of systems in devices as they're already available in nature. However, there are some problems with this, and the first of which is the functionality of these devices is, or of these structures is still not well understood, even though their structure and occurrence is relatively well understood. And the second is that it's extremely difficult to fabricate these types of structures in an experimental setting. And so this motivates the creation of synthetic devices, which exhibit the same types of mechanisms that these natural photosynthetic systems exhibit. And this gives rise to a method that we've developed to describe both the absorption processes in biological systems, as well as the photo excitation dynamics that occur directly after light absorption. And this method, which we call the empirical exciton framework, is essentially um, 
is used to predict emergent properties of these systems based on the individual constituent fragments of the system. So as an example, I've shown this light harvesting complex too right here. And we could actually decompose the system into individual chromophores, which together make up the entire structure. By characterizing each individual chromophore and calculating both the ground and excited state electronic properties, we can actually predict the properties of the full system using what is known as an exciton Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian describes the site energies and their interactions. So one of the most important attributes of this method is the ability to generate a model for each individual experimentally observable system. And the way we do this is by choosing two static parameters and training our model based on empirical training data, which comes from an observable physical quantity. In this case, we've chosen the linear absorption spectrum taken from a photosynthetic bacteria at room temperature. And essentially what you see is the absorption spectrum describes the probability of absorbing a photon com coming at a very specific energy. And you see that our model is in relatively good agreement. And this sets the stage for, for calculating many different dynamical properties of these systems purely based on two static fitting parameters. And so that brings me to the main objective of this model. And that is to describe not only the absorption processes, but actually how the system evolves after absorption occurs. And this describes how energy is transferred and converted in biological systems, but also how we can use those same mechanisms in devices to accomplish many different application-specific objectives. So the difficulty in describing dynamics occurs due to the coupling between the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. And you can see here, these quantities have to be calculated simultaneously because they respond to each other. The electronic structure causes the nuclei to rearrange, while at the same time, the nuclear motion itself induces quantum transitions between the electro electronic states. And so the general algorithm we can use to describe the dynamics involves calculating the excitonic Hamiltonian, which I just described, at each time step, and then computing the nuclear forces and the electronic driving forces and propagating the system using the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So one of the main reasons this method is successful is that the exciton model itself is extremely amiable to a highly parallelized implementation. And what I mean by that is because we can break the system into individual excitonic sites, we can actually describe the electron, electronic structure of each completely independently. And so this, this actually allows for a hierarchy of parallelism, where first we can see we construct the, the excitonic Hamiltonian based on the information aggregated from all of the chromophores in the system. At the inter, intermediate level, on each compute node, we can actually calculate the properties of individual chromophores. while at the level of individual GPU processes, we can calculate the fundamental quantities describing the electronic structure. And these are known as the electronic repulsion integrals. And those of you familiar with quantum chemistry know that these are extremely computationally expensive. And only by porting these kernels to GPUs are we able to actually run these calculations on a time scale that lets us see the dynamics of these systems. So for example, these, these electron repulsion integrals are actually dominated by these terms here, which describe what are known as Coulomb and exchange interactions. So the main goal of these simulations really is to describe what happens after exciting an electron at a specific energy in these large um, biological systems. And so the way we, d we simulate this is by creating an excitation at an energy that, is, that is, is localized at the high, the high energy absorption peak in this system. And so here I'm showing the full complex and also the complex embedded in a protein environment and bilayer, which act to add structural stability to the system. 
And you can see that immediately after photo excitation, the electronic wave function is localized on the outer chromophores. So now we're going to use the al algorithm that I just discussed and allow this system to respond and propagate um, using those governing principles. So we can see that immediately, immediately after photo excitation, we see excitonic diffusion in which the wave function actually delocalizes over the ent entire structure. And at the long time scale, we see what are known as coherent fluctuations, which here appear to be a high degree of system noise, but actually are, are well described, as I'll show here. So if we break this down into the two types of regimes, we see that there is a short time scale regime in which the system immediately delocalizes from the initial excitation, and then a long time scale regime of fluctuation but these fluctuations are actually localized around the inner ring. And so there are two types of design principles that we can derive from these simulations. The first I've already discussed is the spatial energetic correlation between in, in the, the electronic wave function. And all this means is, as the electronic wave function decays in energy, it's also changing spatially. It's moving from the outer rings to the centralized core at a lower energy. A second is the so-called arrow of time, and this is frequently mentioned in the context of the entropy maximization principle. But we can also think of this in the information theoretic idea of entropy, in which we start out in a low entropy state, which is localized around individual chromophores. But as the system evolves, we actually reach a higher entropy state, and the electronic wave function is effectively delocalized over all of the chromophores in the system. So how do we use these design principles in synthetic devices? The first step is identifying types of molecules which have the potential to display these types of mechanisms that are found in these complex light harvesting systems. And we've actually identified a set of molecules which I've shown here known as phenylacetylene dendrimers. And in general, these, uh, these molecules are described by a hierarchical tree-like structure where light absorption occurs at the periphery and energy is funneled toward a localized core. And so the main design objectives that we're interested in here are not only controlling the optical properties, but also controlling the directional transport of energy. And what we found is that in certain types of dendrimer structures, this natural energy pathway is actually an intrinsic property arising from the structure itself. And so you can see here that, similar to in the light harvesting complex, we have localized excitations at higher energy around the periphery of the structure. But as the energy progress, as the wave function evolves, it not only loses energy, but it also progresses toward the center of the structure. And this is exactly analogous to what happens in these light harvesting complexes. And so this spatial and energetic uh, correlation actually drives these transitions and allows us to funnel energy to any spatial location that we want. So this, this sets the stage for the design of types of complexes like this. But it's still an open-ended question as to how do we actually control the properties while at the same time controlling how light it actually is funneled in these systems. And so some of our more recent work actually involves what's known as materials discovery. And so we're looking through an enormous molecular design space of all the possible conformations of these systems using molecular combinatorics. And using efficient sampling techniques, we can get a rough estimate of what types of structures will exhibit certain types of device properties. And this is really the driving force to engage many different industrial and lab partners to, to try to build these systems and, and try to figure out what types of new capabilities and applications we can, we can really find. So I'd like to thank my advisor, Todd Martinez at Stanford, as well as our postdoc, Dave Glowacki, my practicum advisor at Lawrence Livermore, and our collaborator at UCSF who helped with some of the visualizations. <laughs> And most importantly, I'd like to thank CSGF and the Krell staff for their support over the last four years. I'd be happy to take any questions.